she put a pot for she hair and gun. Them a leak for swung out from the dam. Basket for she head, bucket in each hand. Hold up for she frack, I want a she grandson. To the market, them a go. For the morning, the day is dawning. For Kaka Pro to give the villagers a warning. Rise and shine, the birds them a sing. All animal tech torn as them join in the waking. Kaka Pro, Dagaba, Donkey Bray, Horse, and they even duck a qua. Kaka Pro, Dagaba, Donkey Bray, Horse, and they even duck a qua. Come and hear this sweet story that tell the people about life in the country. All day a back down, me now I come home. He naga jackass yard for fetchy load. Cock le shayan, bag over shoulder, running by his side. A Rexy and Rover from the farm, them a come. So I go down, but up the river. Some washing clothes, some folks are bathing at the water. Fisherman, they catch them a bring. From a canoe boat, man, them start a floating. Aymara, Kwakwari, Gail Baka, Kuma, Kuma, even local nanny. Aymara, Kwakwari, Gail Baka, Kuma, Kuma, even Banga Mary. Listen to this sweet story that tell the people about life in the country. Them children glad when the weekend come. Out in the yard, them all gather round. Some are play catcher, some making house from straw. Two who come later, a grandma or grandpa, all a sit down just away. Moonlight so bright, it's just the right time To listen story or to say a little nursery rhyme Grandpa voice a echo in the night As he tell you tell so Hello, this is attorney Shellen Washington Owner and founder of the Washington Law Firm Located at 455 Utica Avenue in Brooklyn, New York We're specialized in medical malpractice, personal injuries, matrimonial law and landlord and tenant. If you're in need of legal representation, please give us a call today. The number to call is 718-877-3100. Consultation is free at no cost to you. So call us today to see if we can be of any assistance to your legal needs. Again, the phone number to call us is 718-877-3100. What is the difference between the ordinary thief and a political thief? Number one, the ordinary thief steals your money, your bag, your watch, and your jewelry. Isn't it? But the political thief steals your future, your career, your education, your health, and your business. Number two, the hilarious part is that the ordinary thief will choose whom to rob but you are the one who choose the political thief to rob you because we choose them we vote them we blindly say we are not blind who is deceiving who the ridiculous part of the whole issue is that we will fight to defend and protect our belongings from the ordinary thief is it not but we fight each other to defend and protect the political thief is that not what we do Thugs will be fighting themselves to protect those that are stealing our career, stealing our joy, stealing our health, stealing our success. What a shame. What a travesty. It calls for us to think and think deep. The stage we are in as a country is not a stage where you become an onlooker. You have become an onlooker for too long must get ready to put your hands to the plow and be part of the process. It's not just about PVC, carry PVC. You must be in the kitchen 
where it is being determined. You must be there where the decisions are being made. If we are there in our numbers, they cannot outnumber us. All right. Hey, guess what? Good evening. My name is Mark Benshap. It's just six minutes after nine o'clock in beautiful Guyana. It's uh, eight minutes, uh, six minutes after eight Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we are getting ready to rock and roll this evening on Straight Up, a very interesting show. In fact, we have with us this evening, um, that's our guest, our regular guest in the background. Uh, it happens sometimes. But uh, yeah, so this evening I have uh, with us uh, a former senior producer of Vice News. You guys know Vice News, right? Vice News is very popular in Guyana right now. It's a popular news entity around the world. I think they're worth something about two point something billion dollars. Um, and so uh, we have a former senior producer from Vice News with us this evening. He's a former um, uh, employee there at New York Times. He's also, he runs his own company, company now, Mission Critical Productions. We will ask about that and more. Uh, right after this. So uh, guess what? Share the link and let folks know that we have an important guest. Well, in fact, all of our guests are important. But this guy is an award-winning uh, producer, award-winning journalist. He produced some programs at HBO. He produced uh, The Bad Humbre, dealing with immigration. He was out in the Philippines. He did some documentaries and so forth on the killing of uh, uh, drug dealers, petty, medium-sized, or even drug lords in the Philippines. He has traveled in over 25, maybe 30-something countries around the world. And sometimes uh, those assignments were not easy at all. He was a former uh, producer for Dan Rather. You guys know Dan Rather, right? All right, so share the link and let the folks know that we have an interesting night. Good evening to all of you around Guyana all across the world, wherever you're listening to us. Good evening, and let's get ready to welcome our guest, Mr. Andrew Glazer. Let's welcome him. Good evening to you, Andrew. Hi, good evening. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule, a busy guy all over the world, doing your own thing right now as well. Uh, first, let's begin with Andrew Glazer. People might want to know, who is Andrew Glazer? Uh, whereabouts in Guyana, uh, not Guyana, sorry about that, but uh, the United States are you. Give a brief background of Andrew Glazer. Well, I live in Brooklyn, which uh, is like little Guyana. There's a lot of Guyanans nearby. Um, I grew up in Philly. Uh, I've got two kids. I've got a beautiful wife. And um, uh, yeah, what else can I tell you? Um, I've been a journalist for uh, about 25 years now. Yeah, that's quite a long time. Uh, you don't look any a day older than 25, you know, 25 <laughs> years. I don't know about this white beard, but that's okay. That's so. What 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 made you get into uh, the field of journalism? Uh, easy. I I really don't like sitting in an office. I love uh, going out uh, and traveling and meeting people and seeing things. Uh, I'm nosy. Um, I have a short attention span. I love switching. Uh, from topic to topic and becoming uh, a you know mini expert on that topic and then moving on to something else. So I really like the adventure. I like um, meeting people uh, and and asking impertinent questions. And I in, in in your career of 25 plus years, you've met a lot of people, especially working as a producer for Dan Rather. What was that like? Oh, it was great. Uh, I had worked as a, a newspaper reporter prior to that. And so I knew nothing about television at all. And uh, Mr. Rather was in his early 80s at that point, um, actually early, late 70s. <clears throat> and he uh, very uh, validly could have been impatient with me and said, why are you putting this producer who doesn't know anything about television? Um, but it was quite the opposite. He um, taught me everything that I know now. Uh, he was patient. Um, and, and, uh, the best part about working with him is, you know, he had 50 plus years doing, uh, journalism and covering the biggest stories from breaking the Kennedy assassination to covering, uh, civil rights movement in the American South in the, uh, early sixties when doing so was incredibly dangerous, uh, to covering 
you know, interviewing Saddam Hussein, he had a really rich, uh, still has a really rich career, um, but he was never jaded. So whenever we would travel together, uh, he would look at me with a smile and say, you know, I can't believe we get paid to do this. Um, and that's the kind of person you want to work with, someone who really loves loves what they do. Absolutely. That's a behind the scene kind of like glimpse in a, a description of the man, Dan, rather that we all grew up watching and knowing. And it's like he's a household and even in Guyana, all over, he's a household. But uh, what are two things you walked away with from Dan rather working with him? Two important things you've learned. I think, uh, number one, he always says, be skeptical, don't be cynical. Uh, that means it's OK to ask questions. Uh, it's OK to um, not necessarily trust everything, but you need to uh, not assume that the whole world is is bad and wrong. Um, you should give uh, people the benefit of the doubt, but it's a reporter's job to be skeptical, not cynical. So that was uh, number one that that I, I have taken with me, um, despite the fact that I, sometimes I'm a little bit cynical. Uh, I try. It's something to aspire to. Um, the second thing that I took away, I think, again, was um, just the uh, the privilege that we have as journalists to travel to places, to ask questions, to um, get to know uh, people in these places and really just kind of dive in um, and, and learn and experience things and and, uh, and develop friendships and relationships all around the world. That uh, That's something that never gets old, no matter how many years you do it. And, uh, and uh, so that, that I, I carry with me. Absolutely. You've traveled, you've gotten awards and so forth, uh, travel around the world. Uh, uh, maybe, can you tell us some of uh, maybe two or three of the most dangerous assignments you've went on? Dangerous. Um, I guess uh, one assignment that I did at Vice News, uh, I covered the 2014 uh, war in Israel, be uh, between Israel and Gaza. Um, and uh, just anywhere where there are um, armed people firing at each other and, and um, rockets falling from the sky. Um, I didn't go into Gaza, but uh, in southern Israel, there was certainly um, rockets falling in and we, you know, saw them coming. Um, so that that was dangerous. Um, uh, you know, I covered, uh, it's not just international stories. Um, I covered uh, the American militia movement and I did a, a uh, an hour long uh, documentary feature for a, a cable channel here. Um, and we were with a bunch of guys that I presumably, you know, a few years later were involved in the January 6th um, siege of the, of the U S Capitol. Um, these were guys who um, armed up and uh, they're not particularly disciplined. They're not military. Uh, they're paramilitary. Um, our country has, as, as I'm sure most of you know, very liberal gun laws, meaning any, almost anyone can buy a gun. In some states, you don't even need to have a license to do it. Um, and these are guys who get together uh, and, and practice shooting and, and uh, do tactical training with each other um, without, uh, with this kind of understanding that um, our world, our country is at siege and that they're gonna protect us from it. And, um, they're not necessarily the people I would choose to, to protect me. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a demonstration where they marched into uh, downtown Columbus, Ohio with long guns and faced off with Antifa people. Unfortunately, no one drew a gun, but it was it was tense. Very tense indeed uh, for folks who may remember that. But uh, growing up in Philly, uh, kind of like a, a really, really, uh, I don't want to say tough, uh, um, Philly, but uh, you think that has prepared you for uh, the kind of tough assignments you've had growing De up in Philly? Yeah, definitely. No, I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious, but Philly is a was a tough city. I think it's still a tough city, um, and uh, I'm proud to have been there. I grew up right downtown um, when not a lot of people were living downtown. A lot of the a lot of the city had fled for the suburbs at that point, point. Um, and I, I was very. I think growing up in a city made me appreciate. Um, you know, being getting to know people and being uh, confronted by action and and different kinds of people, you can't really cloister yourself when you're in a city. You get to you get to see everything and everyone. All right. So I just want folks to know that uh, our guest this evening, Andrew Glazer, uh, worked at Vice News as a senior producer. 
Uh, but you have done some production work, uh, the bad hombre uh, dealing with immigration, and then uh, I think something else out in the Philippines, uh, you know, documentary on the president then, Duarte, uh, going after drug dealers and so forth. Describe that documentary out there in the Philippines. Yeah, so in, I think it was, forgive me for not remembering the exact date, but uh, President Rodrigo Duterte was elected um, president of the Philippines in, I think, 2016. Um, and he, he was elected uh, on the promise that he was going to rid his country of drug dealers. Um, and what he did was, uh, and he's still doing, um, is unleash uh, citizens, uh, military, and local police to kill anyone that was suspected of dealing drugs or even using drugs. Um, so there was, uh, and continues to be, as far as I can tell, uh, a bloodbath. And so I went there in the early days of that uh, campaign, which he called the war on drugs, um, and, uh, and documented actually um, some reporters who were covering the early days of that um, when it was really dangerous to do so and, and where it was really, uh, intense. There were in, in Manila where we were working, uh, there were, you know, dozens of bodies that were turning up every night. And, and some of these reporters were uh, going to every scene of the of the killing uh, and documenting it. So it was a uh, was it was really a pretty heavy assignment. Tough indeed. And I guess sometimes you guys got emotional because of what you saw, because part of what uh, the documentary I saw was that even some of the uh, persons who were accused of being drug dealers when they were incarcerated, they prefer to stay in jail than to come out. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And for me, with the emotional part, you know, you, uh, I, I, I say this, um, and I don't feel good about saying it, but you see a dead body in the streets, and it's really hard to see the first couple of times. And then without knowing anything about the person, uh, it, it you kind of get numb to it. But where, where I felt really emotional was um, when we followed the family uh, through the process of mourning their um, uh, their dead husband, father. Um, and uh, we went from the scene where he was killed uh, all the way to the funeral um, and the, the wake. And it was uh, for me seeing a little girl who was six or seven um, looking at her uh, father in the coffin uh, and, and crying hysterically that after a week of being there, and uh, that was what, what triggered me to really feel sad. Very sad indeed. Look, uh, Andrew Glazer, our guest, uh, former uh, executive, a senior producer there at Vice News. Uh, give us a little rundown about Vice News and what was it like uh, uh, being a senior reporter, senior uh, producer there for Vice News. Uh, talk to us about Vice News and your experience, sir. Sure. Uh, well, Vice, New Vice uh, the company before Vice News, started as a uh, kind of punk magazine and uh and it was not particularly interested in covering world affairs or news um it was kind of irreverent and um uh and and more culture and music oriented um but uh once the founders um uh of vice um hooked up with a, a fairly well-known director named spike jones um they had interest in doing video and they started uh doing kind of um, gonzo reporting around the world, doing documentaries uh, where the one of the founders snuck into North Korea. Um, they did kinds of wild, adventurous reporting that um, was very kind of visceral and 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 uh, was very different than kind of the network uh, Dan Rather approach to covering news. Um, and and as that um, became popular on on YouTube. Um, H well, first I think MTV and then HBO um, contracted them to do uh, a series. And um, that series was incredibly popular on HBO. Um, and uh, most fam famous, their final, uh, one of their biggest uh, episodes, they um, brought Dennis Rodman to North Korea and they yeah, um, wound up, you know, seeing Kim Jong-un. And uh, it was, you know, kind of, the sneaky way of getting into the country and and um, you know maybe poking fun of it a little bit, but also no, wait, wait wait a minute, Andrew. Uh, I, I read a, a part that Vice News was responsible for that, and you just said a sneaky way of getting into the country. Were you on that trip? In North Korea? I was not. Uh, I, I was not. Uh, that was before I started there, but I started soon after that. That 
story really was kind of sensational and it got a lot of press and, you know, um, everyone was talking about it. And it, I'd say that in a lot of ways put Vice uh, on the map. So out of that, after that, um, the founders of Vice said we should take that brand and expand on it. And that was the beginning of Vice News. And that was when I was hired. Um, it was the idea was we're going to bring uh, kind of an irreverent attitude. And that doesn't mean irresponsible. It means um, not so buttoned up as, you know, the traditional uh, news people on TV, um, both in dress, but also in, in presentation. Um, and we're going to bring viewers, we're going to show them some of the parts that you don't typically get seen, get shown on on network TV. So you're going to see the process of reporting. And I, I, I think of uh, a good friend of mine who I had lunch with today, named Simon Ostrovsky, who uh, covered the initial Ukraine invasion in 2014 uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, maybe even a year, uh, where he um, basically the cameraman was following him as he was asking questions and exploring things. And you saw it almost in real time. It was not um, the typical news broadcast where you do the interviews, you do the stand up on the hill with the flak jacket, and then you cut it together. This was much more uh, kind of vis visceral and experiential. And that was the idea. Um, and, and, and it really took off. Um, young people didn't like the artifice of the anchorman and the um, uh, you know, uh, buttoned up news person who uh, was telling you what to think. They liked the idea. They responded to the idea that you could see um, the process of reporting and how hard it is and how sometimes funny it is and sometimes tragic, uh, scary. Uh, but it was always interesting and unpredictable. Um, so that's what we did. I was there for two years. Um, we uh, uh, expanded and grew uh, internationally. And, uh, you know, since I've left, it's only grown exponentially more since then. I can just imagine because uh, you guys, uh, back in your time, dozens upon dozens of reporters, young reporters, not only in the U.S., but around the world as well. Uh, when you guys go to do uh, a story, when you were at Vice News, I'm sure you guys don't just decide on one morning that, hey, we're going to go to Panama or we're going to go to Jamaica or Guyana or somewhere. There must be some sort of research before, right? Yes. Um, usually there is a producer uh, or a team of producers who are doing uh, the reporting in advance. Um, you don't necessarily know everything that you're going to get, but you have a good uh, background in the story. And, and it has to meet the threshold uh, of a whole phalanx of editors and uh and executives within the company who think not only is this a story, but is it one that is interesting to our audience? And on top of that, is it important enough for us to take the risk and the expense of sending you far away to, to cover it? All right, to take that risk and to ensure then that uh, the story is authentic because you guys are not going to just jump on a story for propaganda's sake, obviously not. No, there's no political uh, leanings or agenda um, other than to tell a good story that, that people want to watch and that people will be informed by. You know, I want to ask you a question, other than the fact that knowing that uh, at least you know someone who's from Guyana, maybe you know some other folks who are from Guyana, but what exactly have you heard about Guyana and what do you know about Guyana? Well, I, I know that its rainforest is really big and a big carbon sink for the rest of the world. And so uh, while uh, admittedly Guyana does not get a lot of uh, coverage, at least in the United States, um, it should. It's an important place for the rest of the world. We uh, rely on, on that rainforest to keep our planet from choking to death. Um, I know uh, that there is uh, there are oil interests who have recently uh, moved in. Uh, and have projects offshore, um, and that they are controversial as any extractive industry uh, can be. Uh, there are potential revenues, big revenues for the country. Um, there's also potentially big revenues for those who approve the deal, if uh, you know behind the scenes or or in the dark. Um, and there are also potential risks uh, when you have extractive industries. There can be environmental uh, catastrophes, as we've seen you know, in my own country, off the coast of Louisiana, uh, or, you know, any, you know, in, in Alaska or anywhere else, uh, when you have when you're digging 
uh, or extracting uh, oil or, or gas um, uh, and transporting it, there's lots of opportunity for uh, for bad things to happen. Um, so I know that those are those are concerns in Guyana right now. Lots of opportunities for bad things to happen. Uh, I want I want to take you to uh, a clip. Uh, one of your um, colleagues there at uh, or former colleagues there at Vice News, Isabella um, Young. She did an interview with uh, the uh, Mr. Barrett Jack Deer, who sits there as the vice president of the country. And a lot of people are talking about this. Uh, Mr. Jack Davis had a lot of uh, not so good things to say about the, uh, the journalists, but uh, here's an opportunity for the clip and I'll get your take on it as a, a senior producer. Maybe, maybe, right, maybe the Chinese company that did not get the, the agreement that they wanted here, maybe they're the ones who told you, or it could be just a, a fictitious thing. Okay, well, let's talk about specific individuals. What is your relationship with Mr. Sujiro? Sujiro? Oh, so my relationship? Nothing. He is he's a tenant in my place, yeah. And he's a good friend of yours? Yes, um, yes, yes. He is a friend of ours. His father was here from many years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he lives next door to you. Yes. Um, yeah. you know, he was able to arrange meetings and catch-ups with you at any point in, in the day. He as a friend, that, yeah. He claims that through his very close relationship with you, he's able to get any deal done. Well, I don't, I don't know and if that's able to change laws for investors. But, but uh, then, which law has been changed for any investor? So Sue, Sue told us that yeah. if you want to get anything done in Ghana, you need some hookups. I'm very close with the vice president and the other mm -hmm. officials. The vice president and I share a very close relationship. Also, if we do the business, he'll help out no matter what. There's no no one else who can help like he does. He also said us when he's talking about he yes, but the help. prospect investors that yeah. the vice president said he can change the constitution. He said he can manage. Everything is going to be done soon. He's really treating us as brothers. He's already trying to help us as much as possible. Of course, I need to give back to him in return. Yeah, but that that is, I don't know about giving back, but I do that to everybody who comes to my office. The American companies come here to, to see me and they need a meeting. All right. Uh, uh, Mr. Glazer, uh, Mr. Barajak Dale, who sits there as the Vice President of Guyana. You heard a bit of that. Uh, what is your take on uh, the interview itself, that portion that you heard? Um, so I can't weigh in because I don't know the, the details of the subject. Um, but I do know Isabel Young, the reporter who, who was conducting the interview. I know she's uh, extremely well respected, um, both in the company and outside. Um, she's a serious minded reporter. Uh, and to me, it sounds like she did her, her research. But again, um, I do not know anything uh, about the subject or even, even you know, what the line of questioning was about. But I know that she's, um, she is a legitimate journalist and, and a very good one and has won uh, lots of awards and, and, uh, and does her job well. I know. So um, after this interview was aired, not the official interview, uh, that Vice is probably producing uh, to be released at a subsequent uh, time. Uh, but uh, Mr. Jack Dio and even Mr. Irfan Ali, who is uh, uh, sitting there as the president of Guyana, has had a lot of not so good things to say about this uh, brave reporter uh, that she was basically sent. She has a personal agenda and she's not telling the truth and all manner of things. Uh, uh, are you surprised that these sort of accusations uh, are being leveled against a, a, a journalist or reporter when they ask tough questions? Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised. No, that happens all the time. Uh, it's kind of um, attacking the credibility of the reporter is the last uh, grasp of uh, someone who is being challenged, uh, usually. Um, I, I don't know what agenda she would have in Guyana conceivably, or uh, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I think um, she was probably asking questions that made him uncomfortable. And um, the best thing he can do is impugn her credibility. All right. So uh, let's let's uh, let's let's move on in terms of how things work at Vice News when you were there as a senior producer. You guys go into a country. Uh, you do a story. Um, 
I'm, I'm sure it varies as to the length of time it takes for that story to to be out officially. Officially, uh, what time frame you guys have uh, for a story to be officially out? And it what, really, what, what is the process behind the scene process? There's no easy answer to that. Uh, I have turned stories around next day or even same day. Uh, and I've taken months to return uh, to turn a story around. So it depends on the subject, depends on the uh, the news newsiness of it, uh, depends on what else is going on in the world, depends on what editors are available. You know, when you when you're uh, trying to schedule an edit. So um, there's no there's no single answer for that. Um, uh, but you know, essentially you you edit it and then it runs through. Um, you know, various editors and executives who give notes on it. You make those uh, corrections. They might ask questions. There might be something that doesn't make sense. Um, and you get that feedback and you uh, edit it until it's in, in good shape and then it goes on air. Um, but that, that can be, you know, a few hours for breaking news or it can be several months for a more elaborate investigation. So again, just for uh, clarity and for our listeners to, to understand this better, you being a, a former senior um, producer there at Vice News, when one of your reporters go out or journalists go out and say to someone that they're interviewing that uh, I have information that X, Y, or Z person has said this about you, break that down. Uh, obviously, the reporter, the journalist is not going to go with hearsay, right? They would get everything documented, probably recorded or whatever. Break it down, please. Yeah. I mean, again, if you're, if you're going to... Um... You don't want to uh, give credence necessarily to an ad hominem uh, attack if it's from someone who is not a tribute, who, who's not on the record saying it. For example, if um, you know someone whispers in your ear, "This guy's a crook," you can't report that. Um, but if someone on the record, on camera, or you know, willing to, to uh, stand by their word, they say. Uh, make an accusation against someone, you do what you can to verify it. And that includes uh, ultimately asking that person if it's true or not. Uh, and it's rare that that person will say, yes, it's true. I'm a crook. Um, but you do the reporting you can do. Um, again, there's there's different layers of how to do that and ways to do that. But um, you don't want to just put uh, when someone says something disparaging about someone you can't just run with that uh or if you're if you're a good reporter or an ethical reporter you would not all right and not to not to stick much on this particular subject but uh a situation like that uh the person that's being interviewed that individual is allowed to uh to produce or to release sorry their version of the interview even before vice news comes out with its, its I, own. I, I don't allow that uh, when I'm doing interviews. I don't allow other people to tape it because uh, it is not a reciprocal agreement. Uh, I'm the reporter and he or she is the interview subject, and the subject of my reporting. So um, I, if people have asked uh, to record the interview, um, I'm always wary of what they're going to do with it. And uh, it's also I'm not there to be recorded. I'm there to ask the questions, especially someone who uh, is a person in power. Um, it may be slightly different. Uh, if it's an ordinary person on the street, still, I would prefer that they didn't interview me or, or record my uh, questions. Uh, again, not for any reason other than um, I'm a professional reporter and uh, I, I know what I'm doing with the material and I don't know necessarily what they're going to do with it. Um, uh, that said, I probably have, you know, allowed that once or you know a couple of times, but as a standard practice, it's not it's not common to have um, the person you're interviewing, particularly someone in power, record that interview and release uh, segments of it prior to the story airing. So you're almost, I would say, 100 percent percent certain that, um, or whenever you do a story or your reporters go out uh, before that sort of accusations and allegations leveled against the person being interviewed is that it will be well documented obviously recorded yeah i mean that's your your uh ultimately you can't really use what you don't have um and uh so that's part of the reporting process um again i don't know anything about this particular story and i'd be i'd be stepping out of line if i could weigh if i was weighing sure. on the story that you showed me um but i'd know um 
that Isabel is a diligent reporter and that um, she must have had some uh, reporting ballast behind her questions and it wasn't just out of left field. Okay, certainly not out of left field. She has traveled uh, practically uh, 25 to 30 countries. She's received some awards just like yourself. Uh, what are some of the awards you've received in your line of uh, duty reporting and as a producer as well? Um, well, I, I won an Emmy, which is uh, conspicuously behind me right there uh, with Mr. Rather uh, for a, a documentary we did on uh, on Iranian sanction evasions. Um, that was that was a story that uh, we were proud to 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 get notice for. Um, I guess that's that's the that's the big one. I've been nominated for a few that I didn't win. Um, I uh, back in my early days as a newspaper reporter, I, I uh, won a, an award uh, for in New Jersey for being the reporter of the year there, um, covering various New Jersey stories. Um, that was exciting for my early career. Um, and then the reward is really um, that that we get to do what we do, which is really. Um, it's really a great job, if you like. Congratulations. Congratulations for, uh, for your awards. And, uh, you know, I take my hats off to you for uh, doing what you're doing, traveling around the world, uh, whether it's Philippines, whether it's Iran, Iraq, wherever it is that you've gone. Uh, I want you to touch on uh, the bad hombres and your reporting on immigration matters around the world. Sure. Um, bad hombres was my... Uh, way of telling the story of Trump's effort to build a wall between Mexico and the US. Um, at the time when he was really, um, and that was really what he was elected on, that he was going to stop the flow of, of migrants into the US um, and do so by building this wall. Uh, and the, the idea behind it was that somehow there is them and us, um, which I saw as an artificial uh, and arbitrary um, designation. The reason is um, that we are a country of immigrants. There's very few uh, Native Americans left, um, that our cities depend on a flow of immigrants coming in, that our food is picked and, and, uh, and, and cultivated by uh, immigrants. Uh, the, every restaurant, every you know, business, uh, meatpacking plant, you name it, um, is staffed by, by immigrants. Um, and, and in Southern Texas, where I was filming that, um, there are um, people who speak Spanish exclusively um, and have family uh, just across the river in, in Mexico. So uh, the film, uh, my way of, of taking that on and, and telling that story was through a baseball team, a professional baseball team in Mexico uh, called the Tecolotes, uh, and that means the owls. And they, uh, at that year that we filmed them, um, had started playing half of their home games in Laredo, Texas. Their, their home stadium was in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. Um, but right across the river, there was another stadium and the owners of the team decided to play half their home games in Texas. <clears throat> and so by following that team, staying with them for a season, uh, we wanted to tell the story about the kind of fluidity uh, between the, um, the both sides of the Rio Grande and, and um, and just kind of how the uh, wall was something that wouldn't really be able to divide a place that that sprawls across two countries. Yeah, indeed. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched it yet, it's an HBO documentary, right? It's Showtime. Yeah, Showtime. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just go out there, you'll get to see it. And uh, uh, the situation in the Philippines too, a lot of people may have read about it in terms of how uh, Durant, the president, operated with uh, drug dealers, uh, whether they're small, medium, or large size. Uh, you did that documentary as well. Yeah, only accused, not even not even confirmed or convicted drug dealers. Uh, so what was tragic and scary about that is uh, if you didn't like your neighbor, you could tell someone that they're a drug dealer and they'd be dead the next day. Wow, interesting. Look, after uh, being there at Vice News, uh, operating at Vice News. Uh, you've been practically all over the world. You've worked with some very, very talented reporters and journalists and producers at Vice News. Then when you left, you went on to a big newspaper uh, that's based in New York City, the New York Times. Uh, talk, talk to us a little bit about your uh, journey over into uh, the New York Times. 
Yeah, uh, well, my stay there was brief, to be honest. I was there only about 18 months. Um, I went in to um, help them uh, think about how they would do documentaries for uh, NewYorkTimes.com um, and, uh, and spent, you know, about 18 months doing that. Uh, we did all kinds of stories, quick turnaround, um, longer term documentaries. Um, and then um, I thought it would be a, a good idea to go off on my own. And so that's when I left to uh, start a production company so I could be doing things for all different media, um, short, long, newsy, and, and, and less newsy. Tell us a little bit about your own company now, Mission Critical Productions. Talk about that. Yeah, well, we're based in Brooklyn. Um, we now have one feature documentary uh, to our credit. It's it's um, that was the Bad Hombres for Showtime, um, and we have some great projects that are in development right now that we're trying to uh, raise money for and, and get get going. So there's about five projects um, all around the world uh, and in the U.S. Um, that we're eager to get going and. Uh, it just takes uh, some hustling to get, you know, when you're not in an institution, you're on your own, you have to uh, hustle and ask for money and, and, uh, and pitch a lot. And so that's the stage we're in right now. Uh, and hopefully we'll be on soon. Uh, some film. All right, good. Uh, good enough. Uh, thank you all guys. Uh, all of the guys who are tuned in to us. I see Mary Clarence, a lot of them are busy. They're having their chit chats about uh your works and uh, the fact that uh, you were able to explain at least to some degree how vice news operates and uh, thank you so much for that but uh, uh i i think a, a few years back um you guys were on to a story in guyana because i see uh piracy was high uh, lots and lots of fishermen were being slaughtered almost on a weekly or a daily basis man whatever happened to that story well, we started doing uh, some reporting and I, uh, you were kind enough to swing by our offices and I chatted with you. Um, and then, um, you know, life happened. I think, the, uh, I don't know if it was the war in Ga Gaza or something, um, but I was wrapped up in that. Uh, and then I got my job at the Times and, and never got to it. So um, I hope to hear from your listeners uh, uh, with story ideas that I can do in Guyana that would have... Uh, interest outside of Guyana because um, it is on my uh, list of countries that I've not been to that I really desperately want to visit. Yeah, you should, you, you should have, and you were very close to heading there too. You know? I was, yeah. Yeah. So very hopefully uh, I'm close now. Oh yeah. Uh, very, very close indeed. Uh, for a lot of the journalists in Guyana who are watching, or maybe not just in Guyana, uh, young journalists, young reporters and so forth, what advice do you have for them uh, to stay in the game? Uh, well, good question. To stay in the game, you need to be um, you need to be patient. Um, you need to uh, be willing to learn um, and not necessarily um, you know jump into the biggest story yet. Um, you can learn a lot by finding stories in your neighborhood or um, you know in town halls. <clears throat> That's where I got started, and I was there. You know, it felt like a uh, prison sentence at the time because I was restless and, and wanted to get out in the world. But I think I spent four years covering small towns. And um, my first town that I covered was a, a retirement community in Southern California, which was not particularly exciting or dynamic. But what I learned by doing that was how to find stories and uh, by talking to people and develop trust of the um, the people that I covered and and uh, and get feedback when they liked or didn't like what I wrote and, and having thick skin is pretty important as a reporter um, as Isabel is probably learning right now um, so um, that and and be curious and don't have your mind made up ever um, be willing to go where the wind blows you and and listen to um, people from all different sides and um, that's that's it and you know uh, you'll you'll get great stories that way all right, I'm glad that you touched and don't be thin skinned. There will be allegations and accusations. Uh, I'm pretty sure, as you've mentioned, that Isabel is experiencing that. Uh, what has been thrown at her by those officials in Guyana, it's probably not the first because she's been uh, to many other countries. Uh, so, so did you. 
So these allegations in terms of trying to stain a journalist or a reporter, it happens, it comes to the territory. But what advice you have for those reporters who uh, do their job, like Isabella, like yourself, uh, like others, uh, who sometimes politicians don't like, but they just want to uh, spread all sort of propaganda and uh, silly things about those reporters and journalists, as is the case you've mentioned with Isabella. Uh, unfortunately, that's just part of the job, and and you you roll with the punches and you get it right. That's the most important thing that you can do is is don't mess up, or if you mess up, which can happen once in a while, you you uh, are transparent about your mistake and and you correct it. Um, but being honorable and and uh, and 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 right, um, and um, that's that'll insulate you from feedback. Um, fortunately, uh, I live in a place where journalists don't get killed. Um, the work I did in Mexico, there are a lot of journalists who get killed there regularly. Uh, there's already been, I think, over a dozen in 2022. Um, so that is a different story for them. Uh, you know, they they could teach me. Uh, a few things about how to persist in that environment, but um, in, in my, you know, people can say words to me and, and try to discredit me. And as long as you know you're doing it right, uh, and if you mess up, which is human, you you correct the mistake, um, then you'll be all right. All right, correct that mistake, then you will be all right. Uh, one of the things that I want to ask you before you go, um, Andrew, is I'll head back to that brief interview in Guyana and we'll close off with that. But uh, you said you had lunch with uh, your colleague who covered the uh, the, the, the in invasion of uh, Ukraine back in 2014. What is his take on what's happening right now with Russia's invasion? Oh, it was a very short lunch because he was looking at his Twitter feed and getting texts from friends and contacts. Um, throughout the lunch. And, and I think he felt somewhat helpless being here in the States, in New York, when this is going on. And he was, um, as any reporter in their subject, eager to get out there and cover it. So he's trying to find a way. Uh, he no longer works at Vice either. Um, and uh, he's freelance right now, and he's trying to find a way to, to get over there. Um, and he himself has a very uh, interesting history. He was born uh, in Russia, left uh, with his parents when he was young. Uh, when he was covering the um, the invasion of Crimea, um, he was actually kidnapped by Russian um, separatists or Russia, actually probably Russian army that were not identified as such uh, and beaten up and held for many days and became an international incident where um, then Vice President Joe Biden had to get involved. Um, so he uh, knows very much uh, who the players are in this firsthand and and uh, and what the stakes are. And, and I think he feels uh, eager to, to get there and, and cover it. All right, just wish him all the best. I hope he gets there and be safe because it's good to have good reporters, good journalists around the world doing their job in a very you know hostile environment. Uh, wish him all the best. Hopefully sometime we'll have him right here on 107.1 FM. Um, before we go, though, I hate to put you on the spot. You have done a lot of interviews. You've worked for top class people uh, other than just Vice News and New York Times and Dan Rather and so forth. But when you interview individuals, uh, you are able to uh, assess that person, uh, maybe through body language, uh, facial expression, especially when you ask questions that are tough. Uh, I want to, and, and not necessarily to put you in the spot, uh, I want your opinion on this interview with Isabel when she asked a question about uh, the businessman, Mr. Sue, uh, allegations that's leveled against Mr. Jack Deere and his uh, facial and body language. Uh, let's take a quick look at it again. Okay, well, maybe, maybe, right, may, maybe the Chinese company that did not get the, the agreement that they wanted here, maybe they're the ones who told you, or it could be just uh, a, a fictitious thing. Okay, well, let's talk about specific individuals. What is your relationship with Mr. Sue Jerome? So, oh, so my relationship? Nothing. He is he's a tenant in my place, yeah. And he's a good friend of yours? Yes, um, yes, yes. He is a friend of ours. His father was here from many years ago. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he lives next door to you. Yes. Um, you know, he is able to arrange. All right, uh, Andrew, body language, facial expression. Uh, from that one question, Mr. Sue. Uh, I, I don't feel comfortable. I, I, don't, know, I don't know him, um, so it's hard for me to judge. Um, I wasn't sitting in the room. I'm not a forensic, uh, you know, face reader. So uh, it would be unfair for me to, to try to cast judgment on his facial expression. Um, if I were Isabel sitting in the room, I'd have a better um, perspective on that. But um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I got you. I, that's why I say I don't want to put you on the spot. That's today. fine. You can ask the question. You can see my facial expression that I didn't want to answer that question. Uh, exactly, too. And uh, yeah, perfectly fine. But uh, look, Andrew, it's always a pleasure. Uh, we got to have coffee hopefully soon. Yeah, come to Brooklyn again. Absolutely, uh, coffee. But uh, your closing remarks, please, before we go, because a lot of people seem to want you to be on much longer. But I know you have to go. Closing remarks, sir. Well, uh, I'm I'm honored that you had me on my sh on your show. Um, it was really uh, nice to be able to talk with you, and um, and, and uh, hopefully I was entertaining and interesting for uh, your listeners, um, who I would love to meet one day, and and uh, and I'd like to see. Guyana as soon as possible. So um, reach out if anyone has any uh, any ideas. I'd love to I'd love to find a re an excuse to go there. All right. So again, thank you and continue to be safe. Continue the good job, uh, the good work that you're doing. You have been doing. Uh, I salute you. All the best. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. All right. All right. Uh, you know, I just thought I'd throw that uh, one quick question in there: body language, facial expression. And Andrew said what he said. Andrew will always be Andrew. Uh, he's an experienced uh, uh, journalist, uh, experienced producer. He has traveled the world. He got uh, several awards and so forth and so on. Worked with some of the best, like I've said, uh, former uh, producer, senior producer at um, senior producer at Vice News. And so he was able to break down uh, the behind the scenes, so to speak, uh, operations with Vice News. And uh, just to get a, a bit of what um, what Isabel and reporters, journalists like Isabel have to endure, especially when they go out there and they do their job as uh, professional as she is, and then to be accused of all manner of silly things uh, by someone who just doesn't like the questions asked or the direction that the interview uh, was going at that time. And so uh, Mr. Glazer has admitted, he said, yes, he knows Isabel. He worked with her at Vice News. Um, and so, you know, what, what is there? What is there? So I hope Jack Dare is watching and that there will be other folks who will come on this show uh, to talk a little bit about Vice News as well and to ensure that you guys get a full background and to, you know, just rubbish whatever Jack Dare or Air Finale whatever they have to say, uh, because a lot of people just don't pay much attention to them and their silly excuses. All right, so uh, we'll call it an early night. Uh, there was, um, sorry, there was uh, this protest in Brooklyn. Uh, the folks went out and they were able, they were able to stop, and, and that's a good thing. They were able to prevent that, um, that, propaganda meeting to um, to be a success story for the PPP. So they are obviously upset, but I congratulate those folks who took their time out um, to go out and just to boycott that meeting. Congrats to all the players involved. And uh, to all of you, thank you all so much. Tomorrow, We'll be talking about money laundering in Guyana and how some banks launder money and some big time money launderers, right? Um, so that's going to be tomorrow with um, Thomas Anderson. Thomas Anderson will be our guest tomorrow. And you know, Thomas Anderson is the director uh, um, for an agency out there in Washington, DC, uh, dealing with research and other stuff. So he will be back with us tomorrow, right here on 107.1 FM, 107.1 FM. All right. So for now, thank you all for tuning in. And again, thanks to our guest, um, Mr. Glazer, Andrew Glazer. Thank you all so much. See you tomorrow.
be safe. Don't forget, early in the morning, we have the mid-morning show with Gabby and select Andre and Josh and Earl. Tune in. All the best until tomorrow evening. God bless you. So long. What is the difference between the ordinary thief and a political thief? Number one, the ordinary thief steals your money, your bag, your watch, and your jewelry. Isn't it? But the political thief steals your future, your career, your education, your health, and your business. Number two, the hilarious part is that the ordinary thief will choose whom to rob. But you are the one who choose the political thief to rob you. Because we choose them. We vote them. We blindly say we are not blind. Who is deceiving who? The ridiculous part of the whole issue is that we will fight to defend and protect our belongings from the ordinary thief. Is it not? But we fight each other to defend and protect the political thief. Is that not what we do? Thugs will be fighting themselves to protect those that are stealing our career, stealing our joy, stealing our health, stealing our success. What a shame. What a travesty. It calls for us to think and think deep. The stage we are in as a country is not a stage where you become an onlooker. You have become an onlooker for too long. You must get ready to put your hands to the plow and be part of the process. It's not just about PVC, carry PVC. You must be in the kitchen where it is being determined. You must be there where the decisions are being made. If we are there in our numbers, they cannot outnumber us. But you leave it aloof. Oh, no, no, it's too dirty. It's a dirty game. And then the dirty guy is getting to the game of play and you are there not showing up. And when they begin to make the decisions, you will know whether it's a dirty game or not. The result is always dirty on yours. Dirty on your health. Dirty on your business. Dirty on your success and your career. I hope that is tearing off something in you. So this is attorney Shellen Washington, owner and founder of the Washington Law Firm located at 455 Utica Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. We're specialized in medical malpractice, personal injuries, matrimonial law, and landlord and tenant. If you're in need of legal representation, please give us a call today. The number to call is 718-877-877. 3100. Consultation is free at no cost to you. So call us today to see if we can be of any assistance to your legal needs. Again, the phone number to call us is 718-877-3100.